Okay, um, in page, we're on page 228. So last time we had spoken about how Yosef did not react to, uh, Yosef did not react to being, uh, what do you call it, to being uh, 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 appointed by Paro to be over in charge of Egypt. We had spoken about how Paro was shocked at Yosef's non-reaction, number one. Number two, this is all part of Hashem's plan. This whole idea of Yosef being sold and being brought down to Mitzrayim. And the brothers are going to have to bow down to him. Remember he had the dreams that the brothers bowed down to him. Page 228. What's the point of it all? What's, what, 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 what's, what's the whole point, the overriding theme here? And then Yosef becomes a king for 70 years, 71 years, I'm not sure what the count is. Here's a chumish over here if you want. What, what, what's the point of the whole thing? So the idea here is that the Jewish people have to go into exile in Egypt because they need to be refined in order to receive the Torah. This goes all the way back to Avram Avinu when God said your children are going to end up with the land of Israel. So Avram Avinu had one flaw. He said, Bameida, how do I know that I'm going to inherit the land? That was a slight flaw in Avram Avinu's trust of God. When God said you're going to have children, he didn't ask anything. When he said you're going to get the land of Israel, Avram said, but me how am I, is there a sign that I'm, it's going to happen? That's when he did the bris ben Abisarim. They cut up the birds and the, you know, the, the flame went through. They cut up the animals and the flame went through. And, and, and that flaw is in, in Avram Avinu's level of faith is, for lack of a better term, there's a, a flaw in spiritual genetics which is transmitted to the people. And therefore the Jewish people now have to be in Egypt in order for their faith in God to get to the point of 100% before they could go and receive the Torah. How does the faith in God take place? Because of the ten plagues. Eventually, you'll be in a hopeless situation. You're in a hopeless, helpless situation. Then there are the ten plagues, and the ten plagues are a demonstration of God's precise running of the world to the nth degree. A Jew drinks water, the Egyptian drinks blood, and every single plague, the splitting of the sea, now you're ready to receive a Torah with 100% faith in God. That means that there's some flaw somewhere, and that causes that Avraham Avinu's descendants have to get that faith reinstated. Now, in order to go down to Egypt, well, I'll get the question in a second, in order to go down to the Egypt, so there's a danger. If you're going to be in Egypt, you're going to be in a danger, there's a danger of assimilation. There's a danger of being influenced by an Egyptian society which is rampant with immorality and idol worship. So in order to maintain this distinction uh, uh, between the Jewish people and the rest of the society, Yosef, there's no accident that Yosef becomes the ruler for 70 years so he could control things to keep the Jews separate and exert his influence. Yosef himself, who rose above immorality in the highest, the strongest test possible, now exerts that influence on the Jewish people. This maintains this separation for the 210 years that they're there. There's a limit to how much they're influenced by the Egyptians, even though they're on the 49th level of spiritual impurity, with a set of spiritual impurity. Imagine where it would have been okay, without Yosef's influence. So the whole plot over here, this whole plan that God's spinning the wheels in order, and that's the whole idea of getting the brothers to bow down to Yosef eventually, that shows that they're submitting to him. He's the youngest brother, the second youngest brother, and they always see him as just a younger brother who's, 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 who's uh, uh, usurped the position of authority. And this entire plan is a way of getting the entire Jewish people, the brothers, to submit to Yosef, which means the submission is going to be there. Everybody accepts his authority, and he's able to maintain this influence for 70 years, 71 years over the Jewish people, which then sets the tone for the next up to 210 years when they, when they come out of Egypt, number one. Number two... There's a lesson here that it, for all of us, there's a lesson for each person, because this is a theme that we see in the Torah all the time. We always see that the one who is least likely ends up on top. Right? You have somebody like Leah, who's the Leah, who's the not favored wife, and she's the one who's end up buried, has the most tribes. She ends up buried with Yaakov Vino Mara Samach Pela. You see Yaakov Avinu, who's the pursuit, and he becomes the chosen one. And you see Moshe Rabbeinu, who's thrown out of Egypt, who has to run away from Egypt, and he's off on his own, and what are the, what's the likelihood that he becomes the savior of the Jewish people, and so on and so forth. You find this a theme. So here's Yosef, who's been sold, beaten, you know, and I say, you know, he's the emperor. So this whole plot over here of Yosef becoming the king, this whole idea is for a grand plan, which eventually is going to lead to the receiving of the Torah. Yeah, question, what's your name? Mordechai. Mordechai, go ahead. So, uh, my question is, 
question is, I thought this, I thought that faith is something that it's. I don't think it's, it doesn't sound like real faith because if he does showing himself in such a miraculous way, how is that real faith? They they have to believe no matter what they're about to believe. That's well, like that, that's why there's something called free choice. Uh, you know, we, we also should be believing when we have trouble, don't we? Yeah. And people say, sure, God, uh, automatically, it's a good question, but it's a good that's a good question. The good answer is. The good answer is that that we have to get to a level where the skeptics, you know, there's still skeptics today. You know, people say if God would do miracles for us today, then I'd believe. Well, why are we still here? And I, you know, we're still here, and with with all the efforts to make us not here, we're still here. There are enough reasons, enough reasons for a person who, a skeptic could always say, even the Torah says the splitting of the sea, the wind was blowing. And there are people who say, well, the wind was blowing, and the wind blew, and the water split. And there's always room to be skeptical. People say, do you know that after the 73 war, after the 1973, the Yom Kippur war, there was a rush on tefillin in the country. They could not fill the demand for tefillin. Because every soldier who came back from the front said, I saw God. <coughs> after two weeks, the demand died down. Because after two weeks, and I was like, and I was like, well, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes the enemy throws grenades and forgets to pull the pin. That happens, right? And and sometimes, uh, 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 four tanks on a ridge hold down and beat down an entire div tank division. Right? And all of a sudden, you know, your your mind plays with you. There are plenty of people who say, I swear, if I recover from this illness, that I'll be I'll be devoted to God. And then you know, they recover from the illness, and then oh, well, the doctors were good doctors, this, that, and the other. So a person who wants to not believe will always find a reason not to believe. I heard a story about this woman. This is tough. The woman goes into surgery, life-threatening surgery. She says to the doctor, Doctor, I just want you to know that if anything goes wrong, I don't believe you. I know that you're doing, you're doing, your, you're doing your best. If anything goes wrong, it's not your fault. The doctor says, thank you. That's very kind of you. She goes, but if it goes right, I also don't credit you because it's God who's doing it. You're just his agent. Now that takes guts. <laughs> that takes guts, you know, to go in, you know, to go in and say that to a doctor before surgery. You know, at post surgery, everybody says it. To say it before surgery, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Say it takes guts. Okay, now says the Torah, pasuk forty-two. Vayasar paro es tabato me'ayado. Paro takes off his ring, which is the transfer of power. Vayite no sal yad Yosef. Very similar to a husband giving his wife a ring. That's the transfer of power. Vayalbesh also bigde shesh. Vayasem revizav al tzavaro. He decks him out in royal garments. And this is what the, the Medrash says. That Yosef was, uh, was very powerful and had all sorts of servants. The Medrash elaborates on this. Vayarkev also bemerkeves amishnah sherlo. He puts him in the royal chariot and everybody has to go out and see him and and the, everybody's he said, puts him in charge of all of Egypt. And this, the commentary say, is a test for Yosef as well. Tests, I'm afraid. But you never finish with tests in life. You're never at the finish line. No one is ever at the finish line. Reb Moshe Feinstein wasn't at the finish line. Reb Chaim Kinevsky was. There's never a fin The finish line is when a person finishes his life. After may have asked him to the finish line. There's always a test lurking. Because now Yosef has the test of pride. He finished that, you know, Yosef could very easily go, wow, you know, this is the life. You know, this is the life, you know, now let's enjoy it a little bit. I've been 12 years in a pit. Let's at least take some time off to have some fun. Then we'll get work. No. Yosef immediately, Yosef immediately gets busy with taking care of Egypt. And then in Pesach 45, He names Yosef, 45, six lines from the bottom. We call it Sofnas Paneach. Mitrashi says, the one who the hidden matters are revealed to. Vayitan lois asnas bas potifera koin on the isha. He gives him asnas as a wife. Vayetze Yosef al So we said the Medrash that this asnas is the daughter of Dina when she was when she was violated by Shechem, and she's the adopted daughter of Potifera and his wife. She came down to Egypt and they adopted her. The plain meaning is that they had a daughter named Asas. It doesn't say, the Medrash says that she was Dina, she was the adopted daughter. The Meshachachma, we've mentioned it before, why did Paro choose her to be Yosef's wife? Why specifically her? Why, why does he, he pick Asas? Remember, we had to learn the Rashi that Mrs. Potiphar, by the way, her name was Zulecha. Imagine her name was Zulecha, which, uh, which uh, I once noticed, the Zulecha breaks into two words. Nobody says it's my own, my own idea, which is probably uh, worth uh, uh, as much as uh, 
is, is this piece of paper, but my own idea is that Zulecha breaks into two Aramaic words. Zuleika. This one? No. <laughs> she's, she's off limits. <laughs> Zulecha. Zu, this one, Leika. No. Okay, nisht. And that's not for you. Right? So he is her daughter. Why is it, and this is a, you know, this is, this is a burn for her, for sure, right? <laughs> but why does, why does Paro do this? There's a strategic reason here. Paro's no fool. Why does he do this? He figures, if there's anybody in the country, Yosef's a popular guy, everybody likes Yosef, everybody's got to go over If there's anybody in the country who's got it in for Yosef, it's Potiphar and his wife. And he made them look bad, the whole thing that blew up. And in Potiphar, everybody knew that she is a no good nick anyway. You know, it's a, everybody knew that, 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 that she's probably making up a story because she had though she had a, she was about as 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 moral she was about as moral as uh, as what's her name uh, 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 Madonna. So 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 everybody knew. You know, it's like Madonna saying some guy started up with him hey, with her. Oh yeah, right, lady. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so go learn some Kabbalah. So the the uh, the what do you call it? The 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 the, the, the if there's going to be trouble, that anybody's going to try to make trouble for Yosef, it's going to be coming from those quarters. So Paro puts a stop to it right away. He says, here, we're taking your daughter. If you make trouble for him, you're making trouble for your own daughter. That's what the Meshavach says. So that blocks off that blocks, a good political move. So, so it, just, it, blocks, it blocks off the trouble. Try blocks off the trouble. Now, the Yosef ben Shloshim shona ba'amdol if they paro melech mitzrayim. Vayetze Yosef if they paro vayavor b'chol eretz mitzrayim. So Yosef is 30 years old, and at 30 years old, he's going out and he's running a country. Where was the political training? Where did he have, where did Yosef learn any of this? Uh, how do you know how to run a country? You gotta go run a country, be an Israeli politician. You know, go, go, run, go run a country, go run, go run a, a whole organization. That's the wisdom of a Yosef. Pirkei Ova says, Ben Arboi in Labino. At 40, you become wise. At 30, Ben Shloshin Lekoch. 30 is strength. Here's Yosef, who's an Ish Novon Vichacham. Paro called him, he said he's a Novon for the word Bina. At 30 years old, Yosef already has the, the, the wisdom and the foresight of how to run the country. Now, Yosef, while he's running the country, he has something under, under a, a different plot. He's, he's planning something else because Yosef wants to bring about the plan in order to bring his father and his brothers down to Egypt in order to, to lay the groundwork for the future of the Jewish people. So Yosef goes and he gathers all, or he gathers all, the, all the, what do you call it? He gathers all the food while they have the, what do you call it? The, uh, uh, while they have the, uh, 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 the, 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 the years of plenty. Then, if you look on page 230, it says on page 230, uh, right in a, a little slightly past the middle of the page, about nine lines from the bottom. Vatechilena shevesh neharav lavo kasher amar Yosef. There were seven years of famine. Like Yosef, just like he said, the famine started, Boom. Seven years of plenty. Get you one second. Seven years of plenty, and then there's seven years of famine. There's a famine in all the lands. So again, this goes back. Again, your first name is Mordechai. Mordechai. It goes back to Mordechai. You don't see God's hand over here. All the lands have famine. There's famine everywhere in the world. There's a worldwide famine, except in Egypt, right? Which is why in order to get everybody coming down to Egypt. This is going to force the brother. So you see that God's behind the scenes rolling because God needs something to happen over here. So there's a famine in the entire world. All for what? For one Jewish family. Mm -hmm. One Jewish family, which goes with the, what the Gemara says, when anything happens in the world is for the Jews. It's because of the Jews and for the Jews. Whether good or bad. Whether good or bad, it's because of the Jews. If, something, if there's a disaster in Indonesia, right, or if there's a, an earthquake in Iran, Right? We're supposed to look at it. We're not just to say, ah, well, it's a bunch of Iranians. You know, good couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Right? We're supposed to look at it and say, well, you know, look, there's a God running the world. You know, the Gemara says thunder. What's your reaction when you hear thunder? You make a bracha, right? You make a bracha on thunder. Right? It's a bracha you make on thunder. I actually had a couple of guys, we had an argument here once. So I was walking from the base. So I'm walking outside. Two guys are having an argument. One of the guys says to me, Rabbi, can we ask you a question? And it looked like it wasn't a very, wasn't a very amicable argument. Okay, Rabbi, can we ask you a question? Yeah. Isn't it true that a shahakal, bidiyavid, if you make a shahakal, you're yotze with everything? I've learned to be cautious here. <laughs> I said, well, you know, if, uh, I mean, bidiyavid, you know, you're not supposed to make a shahakal. You can't, if, if you made a shahakal, you're yotze bidiyavid. So he turns to the other guy and goes, see? So the other guy rolls his eyes and goes, Rabbi, he heard thunder and he made a shahakal and he thinks he's yotze on it. <laughs> so I said, uh, no, no, that doesn't, 
that, does, that doesn't quite make it, you know, that doesn't, and then number one, number two, we don't know what the after bracha is on thunder, you know, and make it, make it ala michya, you know, you know. So why, why is there thunder? Why is there thunder? There's thunder, the Gemara says, to straighten out the crookedness in man's heart. Because when they hear thunder, a good clap of thunder, even Donald Trump says, oh, there is somebody more powerful than me. All right, and there's no way to storm, there's no way to storm the, the, the Senate over there. Right? Yeah, there's a, there, the thunder is to straighten us out. So you see that everything's happening. It's happening is because God is running it. And here you have the entire world has a fam- worldwide famine over here so that Jews could sell bagels a little more expensive. You know, that's a, the worldwide fam- famine. That's what's, that's what's happening. Quite a question, go ahead. Yaakov did not know the famine was coming, no. He did not know the famine was coming. Yosef, did, right. And now that the commentators ask, why didn't Yosef send the message? 22 years he's away from me. Why didn't you say, hey, Pa, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm okay now. I'm, I'm king in Egypt. Why didn't Yosef send the message? But, all right, the first 12 years, maybe he couldn't. But then he becomes a king. They got, they, after 10 years of being a king, after 10 years of being there, seven years of famine and then two years of plenty. Why, if 10 years of plenty, two years of famine, till they come down to Egypt, why did Yosef send the message to Yaakov Avinu? So one of the answers is obviously what? Well, then the situation with being Adam will get into it. Oh, he needs, he needs to, the whole thing to play out. There's also one in the commentary says that if he would have sent the message, yeah, he doesn't know where the brothers are holding. If he would have sent the message to Yaakov that he's alive, maybe the brothers would then come down hunting him. You know, last time he knew, last he, all he knew about the brothers up until this point was that they're looking, they're looking for him. All he knew was that the brothers are looking to, you know, they, 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 they were selling him and looking to kill him. Maybe they're, still, maybe they're still looking to kill him. He doesn't know what's going on until he meets the brothers and puts them to a test, which ultimately is going to be determined that, okay, things have changed. But until that point, he didn't know. So if he didn't know, so he can't go and send the message. I don't know what's going on. And therefore, he's got to let this whole thing play out. Okay, now, take a look. Uh, they start coming down, and then eventually Yaakov says to the brothers, <laughs> Yaakov says he wants to send the brothers down. And the brothers said to, uh, 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 originally he did, they did not send Binyamin. Now the brothers come down and take a look on page, uh, skip ahead now to page 234. So I tell you an interesting, the Ben Yoyada has a very interesting, uh, uh, a very interesting idea here. Yosef has set up a system, knowing that they're going to be coming down at some point, he set up a system where he wants to see the names of everybody who comes into the country. Right? And he creates a situation where the brothers are going to end up by him. And uh, uh, Yosef, as soon as they walk into the land, into Yosef, on 234, three lines from the top. Uh, for top, uh, top line, sorry, top line on 234. Bottom line on the previous page. <coughs> Yosef sees the brothers, and he says to them, Yosef, es echa v'hem lo hikiru. Yosef recognizes his brothers, but they did not recognize him. So Rashi points out, sure, because, you know, t- 10 guys come in together, you know, and you could basically put them together, and, uh, and they all had beards, but they had beards when he left. When Yosef left, he didn't have a beard. And now Yosef's fully bearded, so they, number one, they don't recognize him. Number two, there's an opinion that they wouldn't look at him, because they assume that he's a rich Egyptian ruler, he's probably a Russia, and the halakha is you can't look at the face of a Russia. And number three, in life in general, when you see somebody out of context, you know, you just don't recognize, you know, the last thing you're expecting is to see your younger brother as the ruler. It just does not, what he got. there's an opinion that he had some sort of Egyptian headdress, you know, that covered him from here to here. You know, you, you can't say, what, for, for any one of several reasons, they didn't, they didn't recognize Yosef. They didn't recognize Yosef. I've had this happen with friends of mine that I saw from high school who look very much the same. And I look a lot different. And so, you know, they, they talk to a guy, and I know who I'm talking to, and he has no idea. And then I, then I break the news to him. Right. This happened to me a couple of weeks ago at the Kaisla. I met a guy from I met a guy I'd been in high school with. So he was a couple of years younger than me. So as soon as I, I as soon as I met him, somebody was somebody who knew him was standing there, and I said immediately said, "Oh, you're Plony." He looks at me. He goes, "Yeah, I'm David Kaplan." And he's like this. <laughs> he was chewing gum at the time, so he was just kind of like me. <laughs> like, like, that was great. That was a great moment. <laughs> I'll tell you, I enjoyed every every second of it. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. He wasn't expecting. Yeah, he was. He was expecting something different, like like to see me in a penitentiary. So, so, he, so that, that I enjoy. I enjoyed that immensely. There was another guy that I saw 
I recognize this guy, and uh, uh, you know, and and he did not know who I was at some some sort of dinner, <laughs> and I saw this guy, and he's sitting at a table eating. He's kind of modern, very modern dressed, and I come in, I'm kind of haredeized, and I come over to him, and I took money out of my pocket. I just took money out of my pocket like this, and I come up behind him, and I just went. Like like this, you no know, way. and the guy starts. He starts reaching in his pocket. And I'm like, and I started doing more. He said, "Will you wait a second? I said, <laughs> I said David, David Kaplan. Oh, I don't believe it. <laughs> 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 I live for moments like that. <laughs> I live for my. That was why it's delicious. What can I say? Absolutely delicious. Yishmak is the word. That, that, that is the word. And then, yeah. And then at the end, the guy didn't give me any money. So what was it worth? You know. <laughs> He said he just still didn't get it. So, so Yosef, Yosef, look, look what the first thing Yosef says. Look at his strategy. Yosef remembered the dreams. Your spies. First thing out of his mouth. First thing he says to Yosef. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. Now the word erva, which means nakedness, also means the vulnerability. He accuses them of being spies. Why? What's the reason? There's a very good logical reason that the first thing you do is accuse them of being spies. Why? What's that? But why? What's his purpose of doing it? That's why. That's that's how he could justify the accusation. What's his purpose of accusing them of being spies? To see if they come here with malice. I was I was I was told from the rabbi that. I think what it was, they, they, don't, they don't ask too many questions. Right. Once you're a spy, once you're accused of being a spy, you got to watch your steps. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want his cover blown. So these guys are, you know, you're spies. You know, at that point, the next thing you know, if you go, hey, who is this guy? Ah, I told you you're a spy. Mm -hmm. So that it, it, it blocks you off. It blocks you off right at the, right before you can even start. But the Benny Shreis is something brilliant. The Medrash says, the Medrash says, listen to this, it's remarkable. The Medrash says that they went when they decided to look for Yosef. And they, by this point, they decided they're coming to Egypt to rescue Yosef. And they decided to go looking for Yosef. Now, they remember he's a handsome guy, you know, a very handsome guy. So the measure says, where did they go first? They went to the red light district. You figured that's where Yosef would be hanging, a guy like Yosef would be hanging around, right? Probably being used. You know, the Egyptians were extremely immoral. So they go to the red light district, and that's where they were found. And they're brought to Yosef. And Yosef says, hey, now look at the words of the puzzle. The words of the puzzle say, you're spies, you came to see the erva of the land. The plain meaning is you came to see the vulnerability, but the word erva could also mean the immorality of the land. He says, you're spies, and I could prove it to you. You were found in the red light district. Why does that prove it? Because that's where spies often went. Because government officials also used to hang around there, and they would find, they would spill secrets to some of the ladies working there. And the ladies working there were often planted by the enemy because they could get the secrets out of the government officials. So when you were a spy, where did you go? You went to the red light district to talk to the ladies to find out what information they got. So Yosef says that, it was brilliant. Yosef says to them, you're spies. The proof is you went to see Ervasa Aris. You went to the red light district. And the brother then says, no, 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 we're not spies. So the story unfolds. And at a certain point, Yosef says to them, okay, he, he goes, you, you, you guys learned the Parsha already, I don't want to go into all the details, but he gets them to a point where, by the end of the Parsha, he's trapped them. And they, first they go home and they find the money in their bags. They open up the money. Now look at their reaction. What would your reaction be? Boy, if I, if I went home and found money in my bags, you know, I'd be, I'd be pretty happy. You know, go, go home and find, hey, I only had 20 bucks in there, now there's $2,000. Hey, that's, that's, that's what I call a good day, or at least a good start. So what, what do the brothers do? The brothers come home, and they find there's money in there. there there's, there's money. Now take a look, bottom of 234. Uh, no, not uh, uh, what do you call it? They they they, they fill their here at um, bottom of two thirty six. Sorry, they go to the they go to the, the hostel to rest for the evening, and the guy sees one of them opens up his bag to see that there's money in his bag. He sees to, to feed his animal. He sees there's money in his bag. Vayomer four lines from the Vayomer lechav who shav kaspi my money's been put back. 
וגם ידי באמתחתי, it's in my bag, ויצא ליבם, ויחר דו איש הלך יבלי מור, מה זו ששר אלוקים לנו? What's God done to us? I mean, why, what are you upset about? You find money in your bag, what are you so upset about? So they understand at this point this is trumped up charges. Obviously this can't be a good thing. But the commentaries say that there's a life lesson for everybody. When somebody experiences good fortune, does it mean that you're good or it means that the person is good or the person is bad when he experiences good fortune? And the answer is we have no way of knowing. We have no way of knowing. Because good fortune could be one of two things. It could be a person has been good and therefore God helped them to be even better. Sometimes when, when something, but somebody, the reward in this world is not a reward. The reward in this world is a benefit. That means, let's say somebody gives a lot of tzedakah. So Hashem says, oh, you give a lot of tzedakah? I'm going to give you the merit since you've shown you're good. I'm going to give you the merit of him giving him more tzedakah. So he, gives, he helps the guy, the guy gets rich, so now he can give you more. He's earned the privilege of giving more tzedakah. Okay. But it could also be a guy who's no good, and a guy makes him rich because he wants to take away his portion in the world to come. So which one is it? Guy wins the lottery. Normal, if anybody wins the lottery, celebrates. Should you be celebrating or not? Well, there is a bracha we make on good fortune, but along with that good bracha that a per, per, bracha the person makes, there's got to be a, bit, a little bit of caution over here. Objectively, it's considered a good thing. Is it because you were good that you got this good thing? It could be that you got this good thing because the person got a good thing because he doesn't deserve better in the world to come, and God's giving him his, his reward in this world in order to leave him devoid of anything in the world to come. And therefore, the lesson when they say, what's Hashem done to us, that's, an, that's something everybody has to ask. I've had some good fortune. Is this good fortune really good fortune for me? Or maybe I really, while I have this good fortune, I have to use it properly. And I also have to do a little soul searching and see maybe there are things that need to be improved. So, so the, the, the lesson over here is, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I don't know why this is happening. But don't go making any, oh, I must be a tzaddik. There's me and the Chafetz Chaim, you know, because I had good fortune. Oh, it could be as you and the Chafetz Chaim, it could also be as you and Haman, right? So we, so we don't know exactly who I am, do we? And therefore, the brothers I teach you over here, something good happens, hey, hey, go easy, go easy. It's not, not necessarily, okay. So they go to Yaakov Avinu. And Ruvain says to Yaakov Avinu on page 238, the middle of the page, 238. Ruvain says to Yaakov Avinu, he said, we wants to see our, your son Binyamin. Yaakov Avinu says, I don't want to send Binyamin down with you. I don't want to send Binyamin down with you. Why not? Yaakov says, I can't, because Pasuk 38. Vayomer lo yered b'niyim ochem. My son is not going to go down with you. Ki ochiv meis, his brother has died. Six lines at the bottom. Vehu levado nishar ukrao ason baderech. A tragedy will happen on the way. So Rashi says, what do you mean a tragedy will happen? Tragedies can't happen at home? Why is only, Yaakov says, I can't send Binyamin with you. You got to send Binyamin with you. Too vulnerable. Something tragic can happen. So Rashi says that nothing tragic could happen at home. What's the answer? It could. But Rashi brings on and he uses an expression here. Milami, shasotan mekatreg bishasa sakonam. Where's uh where's plus a glam and chess in Rashi? No. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Where does Rashi say it? On Lamed Vav. No, no, no. Rashi says that he, that Rashi says Lo Yer. Was it earlier? Oh no, it's with it's with. Uh, is it with Yehuda? <coughs> Where is it? Maybe on the next page. Rashi says. Somewhere, somewhere Rashi says, this week's part, Rashi says that he can't send Binyamin because he's worried. Rashi says, Hasatan Mekatrik Vishasa Sakano. Hasatan Mekatrik Vishasa Sakano means that the Satan prosecutes in a time of danger. That means that there are different stages in life. When things are regular, when things are regular, stable, so there's one type of, call it a, a, a divine interaction with us. 
in a period of danger, there's a special prosecution. The person has to have big merits to protect him. So Yaakov Vino is saying, Binyamin, if I send him with you, the, all, all uh, uh, travel is considered dangerous. Travel is considered dangerous, especially in the old days where you're out in the fields and you're out on, on lonely roads and there are highwaymen ar around. You, know, you never know what's lurking. Nowadays, travel's, uh, tra travel's less dangerous, but even travel is always, there's always a, a potential danger in travel. Travel, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, there's a lot more security in the airport Right than there is at the that than there than there is at, at the gas station, you know you know there's there, there's security for it's travel. Travel brings with it various perils in each generation of different perils. Ship travel is always travel. Do you know how many ships there are? How many how many boats ships? What do you call it? They estimate to be at the bottom of the oceans in the world. I've read this over. I read this a couple of times. I've seen this. What they estimate ship vessels, tra water vessels that are at the bottom of the ocean across the world since the beginning of travel. They estimate three million vessels. Whoa. That's a lot of vessels. That doesn't mean they're a bunch of big ships. You know, it could be it's also you know it's also canoes or or whatever it is. You know, but but it travel is dangerous. Yeah, you know, people got you know the Rambam had a brother who was lost at sea. You know that the Rambam, that's when the Rambam became a doctor. Before the Rambam, the Rambam had a brother. I think his name was David, if I'm not mistaken, and he supported the Rambam while the Rambam learned. And when his brother was lost at sea, that's when the Rambam right, had to make Parnassus. He became a doctor. That's what they So people got, so travel is dangerous. Okay. So then Yehuda says, hey, I got a better idea. Yosef says, I got a better idea now. What I want you to do is I want you to go, you bring him, they bring down Binyamin. Yehuda says, I'll, I'll bring Binyamin down. I'll take over for Binyamin. Okay. So he brings down Binyamin to Yosef, and Yosef plants the, what's it called? The, uh, the, the cup. What's it called? The, the fancy word. The goblet, the goblet. Oh, yeah, you guys been reading too much, too much Harry Potter. But he, he, what he, he plants the goblet in Binyamin's bag. Okay, so they start traveling, and they get to the what he called, and Binyamin opens up his bag, and uh, uh, um, the the, uh, uh, the the what he called. As soon as he opens up the bag, he finds his goblet, and uh, where is it? Okay. Bottom of 244. They sit around with Yosef where they bring Binyamin down. I want to show you something over here because this is also part of, the, part of his plan. They sit in front of Yosef, four lines from the bottom, in order of age. By age, old to young. The people are kind of bewildered. Like Yosef is naming them and telling them where each one's going to sit. And he knows each one's age, each one, they go, whoa, this guy's good. You know, like, whoa, how does he know all that? He starts giving them, how does he translate masos? Portions. Binyamin's portion is five times as much as anybody else's. Why is he doing this? Oh, let's see if they're gonna how they're gonna handle me favoring Binyamin. Let's see if they've overcome the jealousy. Vayishtu vayishkiru imo. They drink and they become inebriated with him. This is also a test for them. They have no choice. They'd rather, even if they'd rather not drink, now they have to drink. Why? Why do they have to drink? Number one, it's always good to do what the king says. Even more, why specifically to drink wine, alcoholic beverage? Because you have to, if all of a sudden you're resistant to drinking, like, <laughs> why, why don't you want to drink? What are you worried? What are you worried you're going to say? Right? What, what are you worried about over here? You know, oh, yeah, we're not, you know, oh, you know, we're, if you don't want to drink, that means that you think you might be a spy. And you're worried you're going to spill something that you want to spill. Something, no pun intended. That you're going to you're going to spill some beans over here. And you know, so they have no choice but to drink to show that we're not spies. If you're a spy, you're going to be very careful when you drink. Yeah. Question. Your name is. Shlomo. Shlomo. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, how could they drink? Um, weren't they worried about it being kosher? No? Good question. The uh, uh, the the uh, what do you call it? The um, the <coughs> first the, the first answer is it's an excellent question. As a matter of fact. Um, Yosef made them a food, and it says that there was some sort of way they knew that the food was kosher. I don't remember how, but it's a very good question. First of all, it's a rabbinic decree that should come to much later. 
they are not allowed to drink the gory wine. But the question is an excellent question because the Chazal say that they kept all the laws. On the other hand, they contended that they were Noahides. That was one of the disputes between them and Yosef. Originally, what's their status? Do we got the status of Noahides or do we have the status of Jews? Even if we kept all the laws, but do we have the status of Noahides? If you have the status of Noahides, there's no problem with drinking the wine. But it's an excellent question, excellent question. So they drink the wine. And then, or it could be they, they saw the wine, they, they squeezed the wine themselves. This is a good, the question is better than the answer. Excellent question, Slavik. So Yosef then says, okay, I want you to put the uh, goblet in Binyamin's, what do you call it? Now here is the final point. They go and open up their, their what do you call it? The guy comes chasing after them, and he says, hey, why just steal the king's goblet? I said, what are you talking about? And he goes and he searches it, and he finds it in Binyamin's, what do you call it? Now, so what do they do? They go back to Egypt. And Yosef says to them something very, very, kind of, it annoys them. <coughs> Yehuda approaches, and Yehuda says, okay, you nailed us. We'll all be your slaves. We'll all be your slaves. And what does Yosef say to Yehuda? Yehuda says to him, page 248, Yehuda, what can we possibly say? Six lines from the bottom. How can we justify ourselves? God has found our sin, meaning they ascribe this to the fact that we sold Yosef, so we're all in trouble. Now this is we're getting back what we deserve. We are your servants, us, and the one who you found the Gavia. We're your servants. Implied in that is we deserve this punishment because we know we sold our brother all those years ago. And the guy who you found the goblet, which is Binyamin. Vayomer chalila li me'asozos. Yosef says, chalila. Chalila means it's, just, it's profane. Ha'isha asher nimtza gavia biyadu hu yeli yaved. The guy who's got the gavia, he'll be my slave. V'atem alu l'shalom elavichem. But Yosef, you go. I don't, I'm not unfair. Why should you all be, why should you all be put in jail? Go, go back up to your father. I'll keep him. He's the thief. I'll keep him. That's how the parsha ends. Look at the next part. Vayiga she love Yehuda. Yehuda approaches. Vayomer <coughs> Please, my master. Which is our way of saying, with, with all due respect. And by the way, gentlemen, if you ever hear that expression, when somebody says to you, with all due respect, that means you're about to be insulted. <laughs> right? With all due respect, sir, you're incompetent. With all due respect. <laughs> with all due respect. So you just says, be Adoni. Please, my master. I would like to say something to you. Don't get angry. Which also means that you're going to have plenty of reason to get angry. If somebody ever says to you, don't get angry, that means you've got plenty of reason to get angry. I told you, if your wife ever says to you, don't get angry, you walk in the house and says, don't get angry, right? Don't get angry, but. Now that does not mean, I told you, that does not mean that your mother-in-law is coming for a visit. Because uh, listen, that's, one, that's life. And it doesn't mean that supper got burnt. Because wives are good at putting together stuff. They can put it in 10 minutes. So they go, go sit up. If your wife says to you, don't get angry, <coughs> but, that means you now have less money than you did previously. That's what that means, right? That means that she's done something. Uh, she was experimenting with the washing machine. Right, the car is no longer. Uh, uh, something has happened. <laughs> that, uh, something has happened that is going to cost you a boodle. That's what "don't get angry" but means, right? So yes, yes. So okay. she says, "Don't get angry." Because I see you as Paro. Now, the first thing is that the plain meaning of "you are like Paro" is that you got to butter the guy up. Right? Uh, people in authority don't like being argued with. People in authority don't like suggestions. They like being argued with. The first thing is, listen, I see you're really a powerful guy. You are really something, which, by the way, the commentaries say, that's why when we daven, we always start with praises of God. Why do we start with praising God? Gemara says, first praise God before you start asking for things. Why? God doesn't need our praise. But symbolically, the idea is, if we would just go ask for something, oh, God, you know, could, you, could I have a little bit more money? That means you're upset with God. You're upset with God. You feel that something's not just here. So first we do is we praise God. We talk about how just God is. And that the truth is I'm really undeserving. But 
maybe I could just ask for a favor. I got a few more bucks over here. A couple of bucks would hurt, right? As opposed to, I need more money. What kind of business is this? Why does he have money and I don't have it? You understand there's a difference. So you start with the praise to the king. You're saying, yeah, you're the king, you're the emperor, you know, you're great. You're just like Paro. So, so I don't mean to imply anything, anything, what do you call it? But really, you know, I don't understand what's happening over here. I, you know, maybe we could beg for some mercy. That's one, that's one idea. The other idea is he's saying, Rashi says, you're like Paro. If you tick me off, bro, I'm going to kill you and Paro. That's what Yehuda, that's what Yehuda is saying. If you get me too ticked off, now let's, let's, why does Yehuda feel, why all of a sudden Yehuda steps forward here? Yehuda steps forward here. He says, hey, no more. We're done. We're done. Let's, that's it. That's it. We've, we've been patient long enough. Something here has gotten, has, 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 has rubbed Yehuda the wrong way. Something here has, has, has pushed the button. What button has been pushed? What do you say, Nate? I think it's because he's experienced uh, losing three uh, children. That's why he said to Yaakov, Ruvain had offered that Yaakov should put to death his two children. You would have never said that because he actually experienced it. But what's something about Yosef has ticked Yehuda off over? We'll see tomorrow. It's a show.